to the end of it, we're in chapter 6. Uh, we're going to be looking at the full armour of God, you know, our final section in Ephesians. That's, uh, that, that we all know, but sometimes we don't know the other sections in Ephesians. So we're going to be um, looking at the full armour of God um, in, in a week or so, and that'd be really exciting. But, but for now, there are some very practical things for our lives as we've been looking at. And um, as I, I said uh, uh, last week, Paul wrote this uh, letter to a, a church that uh, was based in Turkey in the first century. And it's a letter that focuses on the purpose of the church and the responsibilities of those within it. So it's really relevant to us today, really relevant. And if you remember, last week we looked at the responsibilities of uh, uh, people who have children, mums and dads, or grandparents, parents and grandfathers. <laughs> uh, uh, we looked at the responsibility of parents and, and children uh, who, who love and follow Jesus. We looked uh, at this by using the World Cup as uh, an illustration by highlighting how when we become parents, we can often feel like we're no longer enjoying the thrill of being in the action on the pitch. But we can often feel like we've been relegated to the stands of life and we're just spectators of what's happening in life. We can feel like that, can't we? We looked at how this is really quite a fallen way of thinking and how we need to snap out of it and how we need to see our families uh, and our children as a blessing and that by being servant stewards to our families, we can actually find fulfilment and purpose in our lives. We also, uh, last week, gave a little introduction into the second part of this message, which relates to our working lives on the pitch and in the dugout. And that's uh, that, what I was saying last week, was what we were looking at over last week and this week, was like a mini-series within our series, if you like. This is all about family life and the workplace, which are very, very important things for each one of us in here this morning. So, so we looked at those things, didn't we? Um, we gave a little introduction about um, what's going to happen this week. Now, uh, uh, the second part of last week's message is what we're going to look at today, yeah? And um, I, what I wanted us to do again this week was just kind of go back to what we looked at last week, uh, the kind of time and culture in which this letter to the Ephesians was written. Uh, it was a time, of course, where uh, Turkey was occupied by the Romans. Um, uh, so, uh, Turkey, uh, so Ephesus in Turkey was a, a Roman colony. And obviously the society of the day was quite different to our society today, but lots of similarities as well. I said last week there was no welfare state, so if you didn't have a trade or, or you, you, uh, you, you, uh, you weren't fit enough to work, um, you, that, that, that meant you were in trouble. Yeah? We, we looked at how uh, elderly people, how um, pe people... Um, with, with children, perhaps uh, in, a, in, a, in a, a single parent scenario, unskilled people, unemployed people, often found themselves in slavery. They would end up in slavery because they, they were vulnerable. And uh, we looked at some of the statistics from the first century, we looked at how um, uh, in, in the Roman Empire as a whole, there were 60 million <coughs> slaves in the Roman Empire. Now you can't imagine that, can you, in our generation? 60 million, it's like a population of of the UK, isn't it? Incredible. So we looked at that. There's a massive figure, loads of people everywhere with slaves, you know, you would have seen slaves in the streets, uh, in the fields, in, in, in the quarries, all those kind of places. It was a massive thing. And uh, in the first century, uh, the culture was a cruel culture, a very cruel culture. Now, sometimes we look at our culture and our society and we think it's cruel. But I want to tell you, in comparison to the first century, this, the culture there was excessively cruel. And um, a large percentage of uh, people within um, that, that kind of cultural context were treated very harshly. There were lots and lots of slaves, and in the first century, um, of course, you didn't have things like multinational companies that people could go and work for. You didn't have uh, things like, um, you know, po large political organisations and, and local government that people would work for. You had kind of small outposts and, and a control system. So it's quite different to the way things are today. Quite different. Home ownership was low. Um, and, and what Paul's 
I would find was that these people in very vulnerable situations were hearing about Jesus crucified on the cross, raised from the dead, very much alive and working people's lives. Um, this Jesus could offer forgiveness and freedom and breakthrough in people's lives, if they, whether they were slaves or whether they were in the highest positions of society. They, they were introduced to this Jesus and started to live their lives and follow Jesus Christ. And Paul, in this section that we're going to look at today, uh, gives instructions to people who were Christians who were in, in slavery and also people who become Christians who were slave owners. They owned slaves. Um, so he gives instructions to these two types of people in terms of their work and, and the rights of the worker. Now, I want to say the Bible never endorses slavery. The Bible accepts slavery because slavery exists. It exists today in society, in the world. Uh, it, it existed in the first century, but it never kind of endorses it and says it's okay. It says, actually, it says slavery is a, a bad thing. And the only reason we have slavery is because men are incredibly fallen and like to control and, and, and have uh, <coughs> dominion over other people. Yeah? Now, in the UK today, as you know, we don't have slavery as such, um, but there, there is an underground slavery, isn't there, like the, the, the trafficking industry where people are trafficked for sex or trafficked to uh, manufacture drugs and, and things like that, you know, like people who work in these, up in people's attics, growing weed and stuff like that. There's that kind of slavery that goes on, an underground form of slavery, but thank the Lord, slavery was abolished, wasn't it, in the UK, in many many hundred years ago. Okay, so, so, so we have all these things going on as a backdrop to this passage. Now, all the scholars I've looked at when I was preparing this message recognise that uh, you can look at these verses not just in the context of slaves and slave owners, but also in the context of employees and employers in the workplace. And we'll see that there's lots we can get from this passage about working about our work lives, if we've got jobs or, or if we've not got jobs about, you know, um, what God says to us about work. It's really good stuff, really practical stuff this morning. So let's have a look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses uh, 5 to 9. Ephesians 6, verses 5 to 9. Okay, so just five verses this morning. It says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear, and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favour when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will, will reward everyone for whatever he does, whether it is slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no favoritism with him. Okay, so that's the passage. It's a great passage, a little bit complicated some of the language in there, but we'll unpack it as we just um, spin through the verses together. Now, for, for most people in the first, in first century Ephesus, life was lived on the pitch, yeah? People's lives, um, many of whom were slaves, uh, lived under the gaze of wealthy taskmasters. Uh, they were people who were out in the field. Yeah, they were out in the field. Uh, so their performance on the pitch of life either uh, brought rewards or brought punishment. Yeah. Now, for many of us in here today, we're blessed with jobs. Uh, we know that hard work brings rewards, and negligent work brings us hassle, doesn't it? You know, with all of our time in our work lives, when we've been ne negligent, because we're all human. And of course, when that happens, it brings hassle. It brings criticism. Sometimes it can bring us the sack, can't it? And that's why Paul says, in, the, in, in, in verse 5, that we're to respect and fear our bosses. Now, I'm not saying today that bosses can never get it wrong, and they're not cruel, because sometimes they are, and sometimes they can be. I've worked under cruel bosses in the past. But what Paul is saying is that, you know, I, I, I would also say that if you're in a, in a position where maybe you're being bullied and where you've got to be tough, you've got to stand up for yourselves, 
uh, you've got to know your rights, yeah, within the workplace. But, but um, within this passage, what we see is that if we're diligent at our work, whether it's tossing burgers in, 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 in a burger shop or whether it's directing a company, if we're diligent, if we do our best, people will notice and we'll get praise and we'll get benefit for our work. Now sometimes the, uh, we're in jobs we don't like, aren't we? Who's ever done a job they hate? I've done quite a few, I can tell you, and I'll tell you a little bit about them later. We're, sometimes we're, we're in jobs we don't like, we're in jobs we, we would rather not be doing, uh, but we always have to remember that ultimately we're doing it for Jesus, so our performance and our diligence at work matters. It matters. Because everything we do reflects who Jesus is, doesn't it? The Bible has loads of positive things to say about work. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10 says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your mind. For in the realm of the dead, where you are going, there is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. Proverbs 14, 23 says, All hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. Proverbs 8, 18 verse 9 says, one who is slack in his work is a brother to one who destroys strong words. There's, there's more verses about work. There's loads, I've just picked out a few, but there's loads and loads of verses about work. Whatever you do, work in it with all your heart, working for the Lord, not for human masters. Very similar to the passage we've read today in Colossians 3, 23. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 11. And to make your ambition to lead a quiet life, you should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 But even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. And 1 Timothy 4.10 uh, That is why we labour, or work, work and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God. He's the saviour of all people, and especially those who believe God. So work, friends, is good for us. And Paul and the, you know, uh, the psalmists and all different kinds of people who wrote about work encourage work and said that work is a good thing. Now I want to encourage anyone in here today who is fearful about work, who's had a bad experience of work, who, I want to encourage people who've not worked for a while, but God desires for us to get the support and the training and the skills that we need to try and get ourselves back into work because work's a blessing. Works a blessing, friends. Why? Because God desires for us to, to find work, whether it's mundane or fantastic, because work is a gift. It's a good thing for us, yeah? And we have an opportunity to demonstrate our honesty, don't we, in the workplace. We have an opportunity to demonstrate our commitment in the workplace. We have an opportunity to, to demonstrate the kindness of Jesus in the workplace. We have the opportunity um, to show people what patience looks like and what a, a, a good work rate, a good work ethic looks like. Uh, some people that are working alongside who are perhaps slacking a little bit. Um, we have an opportunity to demonstrate all these incredible characters about the, the characteristic of us following Jesus. Um, uh, you know, when we, when we choose to and when we get an opportunity to find uh, a, a place where we can work, uh, which is a fulfilling thing to do, isn't it? It's a fulfilling thing to do. Now, I want to tell you, it's not always been fulfilling. <laughs> Sometimes I've done some jobs that are very, very unfulfilling, but, uh, you know, even in those uh, times where it's been a little bit unfulfilling, th there's, there's been reward for the work that I've done, yeah? There's been reward for the work that I've done. Sometimes I've been in jobs that are very lucrative, but, I've, but, but it's been very unfulfilling what I've, what I've done, but there's been... Fulfillment through the reward, through the payment, through whatever. There, there will always be something positive that comes out of our work. When we work, we're in a position to give generously, to tithe, to support the work of the church. So the church can gain more influence in the community and have great resources, uh, both people resources and material resources, to tell people about Jesus. It costs to tell people about Jesus, friends. If we want to reach out into the villages, it costs. If we want to uh, reach out into our town at Hollyhead Festival, which we're going to do in August, it costs. All these things cost, don't they? If we want to employ um, people to, 
uh, facilitating the administration and, and the teaching in the church, it costs. And when we work, we have an opportunity to sow into the most important thing uh, in our lives. Jesus Christ and his church. Yeah? Hard work, interaction, is an example to people who don't know Jesus. It's an act of obedience as uh, uh, when, when, when we choose to offer our lives to God in this way. Let's read verses 5 and 6. Slaves obey your earthly masters with respect uh, and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favour when they rise on you, but like, uh, uh, like slaves to Christ, do the will of God from your heart. You know, <laughs> we have to get to a place somehow, and I know it's difficult, friends, somehow where we're doing life with all of our heart, mind, soul and strength. John Stott says our great need is the clear sightedness to see Jesus Christ and Him set before us. It is possible, it is, it, it, it is possible for the housewife to cook a meal as Jesus Christ, as if Jesus Christ were going to eat it, or to spring clean as if Jesus Christ was going to be the honoured guest. It is possible for teachers to educate children, for doctors to treat patients and nurses to care for them, for solicitors to help clients, shop assistants to serve customers, accountants to audit books, and secretaries to type letters as if in each case they were serving Christ. Can the same be said in relation to the masses of industrial workers with tedious routine machine mining to do? And to miners who have worked underground, surely yes, surely yes. You see, whatever we're doing, <laughs> if it's a heart thing, we're doing for Jesus, yeah? Surely, surely yes, work can be a good and a positive thing for each one of us in here this morning. And you know, in an area like Anglesey, tourist area, it may be that we only work for a short term or for short periods of the year. Maybe for three, four months. I tell you, three or four months of work is gonna um, be a blessing to us if we can get that, yeah? It's gonna be a blessing to us if we can get that. But we need to be in a position where we try and get to work and where we try and get back on the pitch and start meeting some people who don't know Jesus, who are working selling ice creams or work, working combing the beaches and getting the rubbish off the beaches, whatever it is, we need to try and find something to do, don't we? Because it's rewarding and God's uh, provided that for us to do. And, you know, you may be sat in here looking around this morning thinking, well, it's okay for some because they're, they're gifted, they're educated, they're skilled, uh, they have work already. I want to tell you, I know how hard it is in an area like this. And, you know, I, we've come from, uh, you know, uh, Somerset where... They had Westland helicopters on the doorstep that employed, employed like 5,000 people out of a, 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 a town of 40,000. So it's massive in terms of the employment that a place like that can offer. And we know that things like, you know, obviously Anglesey Aluminium went and, and lots of other industries have gone. Um, it doesn't mean that industry's not going to come back here at some time. And if we're doing something, we're preparing ourselves for maybe uh, opportunities in the workplace where bigger industry might come. You see, it's, it, it, if we've got a job, it's easier to get a job. Yeah? So if we've got a job, it's easier to transition into another job. And I want to encourage you that, um, that we, we can find something to do. Yeah? You know, some of us, we might be out of work for a season because we're ill or because, you know, there's, there's, there's just problems with our health. Yeah? And, and that's something we can work at, isn't it? We can work to get ourselves back in shape. Uh, I've been trying to work and get myself back in shape for a couple of weeks, and I'll tell you it's hard work, and I'm not getting it uh, very far. But my intention is to get in shape. But we can work, can't we, to get ourselves in shape? Yeah. Um. Um. What, where, where am I up to? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so we can work and get ourselves back in shape, prepare ourselves to be entering the workplace again. And many of you know, we have a lady who lived with us called Anna. Uh, she's got Asperger's, she's got a learning difficulty. But she works. She works in a supermarket, 
and um, and, and uh, it's good for her. She enjoys her work. Yeah. You know, in my working career, I've worked in market gardens. I've done harvesting in fields. I've I've served people burgers, I've done admin work, I've done I've worked for a local paper, I've done tomato packing, I've stapled cardboard boxes in a factory, I've, uh, I've, I've worked in an ice pop factory packing ice pops, uh, I've worked in an abattoir, I've worked as a waiter, I've worked in call centres, I've been a sales executive, I've been an account manager, I've been a church cleaner, I'm a pastor now, uh, I'm a carer now. Yeah? So I've done lots of different things. I've had to change and morph and be, you know, all the time because I realise and recognise that work is an important thing. So whatever I, I can find to do, I, I, I find something to do when I do it. On Tuesday I've got an interview in Wrexham for, for part-time chaplaincy work at, at this bit of Gwynedd. So you can pray for me about an interview. Uh, whether it's God's will. If God wants me to do that part-time, maybe seven and a half hours a week, I've got to open the door. Uh, for, for that to happen, which take a bit of pressure off the church here, yeah? Maybe just for a season. I thank God, you know, for every job I've done, because I've learned loads of stuff, I've met loads of people, yeah? Some jobs I've hated, some jobs I've loved, and I've had to leave because God's pulled me to something else. There have been times when I thought I'd never work again in something that I really loved and wanted to do. God has blessed me every time and lifted me every time. And if He can do it for me, He can do it for each one of us in here this morning. He can do it for each one of us. You know, there's, there's a guy connected with this church who's had to work for maybe 14, 16 months, yeah? Um, I asked if I could, could mention him. I texted him the other day, but unfortunately, uh, he didn't get back to me. But, but he was connected with us, and he just thought, I'm never going to get a job again, yeah? And uh, came in a few times and prayed together. And I told him, God will open a door for you. God will open a door. It might be you feel like there's no hope and, and it's never going to happen. God's going to open the door. It'll come at the time you least expect it. Well, I feel that God opened the door and he's even worked starting a part time contract and now got a permanent contract. I tell you, God will help us in the workplace, He'll help us. And of course, there are lots of us who can't work, you know, we've got small children and things like that. There would be seasons when we come out of work, but, um, you know, it's good to find something to do. So maybe we can work in the church or do something in the church or, or, or do, do a bit, you know, do practical jobs in the church. Come and talk to me. There's loads of stuff here to do. One thing I love about Nick, who's in with us this morning, is that he's always saying, oh, what can I do, you know, to help? So, of course, we can do some touching up jobs on the front of the building the other week, just painting, and uh, thank, thank you for that, Nick, and for your enthusiasm, but there's lots of things we can do, we don't need mega skill to pick up a paintbrush, we don't need uh, a lot of gifting and, and degrees to come in and sort out the, the, the admin cupboard, you know, or to, we don't need all that kind of stuff, do we, we can just do stuff. And if you're struggling in this area, I want to tell you that God can open a door, yeah? He can find you something rewarding to do because He loves you. God loves you. And he can find you something to do. You might think you're never going to work again. You might think that it's just too big a, a chasm to, to, to get over. I want to tell you God loves you. He loves you. Verses 7 and 8, there's a confirmation of that. A master... Uh, oh, no, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing that. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so far... Uh, wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever he does, whether he's a slave or free. Now, God wants to reward us, doesn't he? Whatever our situation, he wants to reward us, whatever our situation is. Yeah? So I want to encourage you, you can open doors. You can open doors. You can open doors so we can get back on the pitch. We can get out in the real world and we can connect with people. And yes, there's going to be times when we have some killer tackles on the pitch. Yes, there's going to be times when we're left on the subs bench now and again. Surely, we're going to feel more alive working towards some goals than being stuck in a rut. And, and, um, and, and I just really want to say this from my heart today. I'm preaching on this stuff because 
it's in God's word and we're following in series. This isn't in a way to have a go at anyone or point the finger at anyone. It's just practical stuff that I found that what has worked in my life and it is working in other people's lives and, and that God loves us and he wants us to be in a place where we're, we're finding fulfillment in what we do. And I know lots of people do lots of different things in the church and contribute in lots of different ways. But God, um, God, God, God lo loves us in all of that. But, but sometimes he wants us to be in the real world as well, you know. He wants us to be in the real world as well. Now, just a short, a short note for the retired. Yeah, <laughs> we've got quite a few retired people in the church, haven't we? And uh, you know, what do we do when we retire? What's the culture of our generation? The culture is, I'm retired, let's relax. Yeah. <laughs> But when actual fact you look around a lot of retired people I know and they're busier than they've ever been. Yeah? So there's opportunity when we retire to be busy, isn't there? But let's be busy with the right things. Yeah? We've got the kingdom to build for Jesus Christ in this church. The kingdom of God to build for Jesus Christ in this church. A witness to Jesus being crucified on the cross, raised from the dead. A witness to a Jesus who can break into any person's life in this town, any person's situation in this time, in this town, and, and, and point out things in their lives that perhaps have gone a bit skew with, uh, things where they thought they were they were wonderful, and yet uh, God brings us down a level because He wants to humble us. If God wants to bring us to a place where we realise that absolute, complete need to be saved even from the good things that we've done, because nothing that we've done that is good, is good enough for God, because God's, God's, God's better, isn't he? Everything that we've done, everything that we do in our lives, you know, we can celebrate some stuff, but we know that the Bible says it's like filthy rags before God, isn't it? We're fallen people, and in, in, in everything that we do, there's going to be an element of, it could have been better, isn't there? And of course, we do strive to get better, because because there's that thing in us that God's put in us. Because we're, we're, as we serve a perfect God, we want to seek perfection in what we do. But we always know that we can do something better, don't we? You think of the great artists in the world, yeah? And some of the great things they did, and they, um, they, some of them were so frustrated, they cut their ears off and did all kinds of crazy stuff because they were just so frustrated that they couldn't get to that place of perfection. But it didn't stop them, did it? So, 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 so that's where we're up to on, on, on that side of things. Now, what about in the dugout? Finally, we see that some of us get the chance to oversee things from the dugout. Now, think of a manager, football manager. They're in the dugout, aren't they? To, to be honest, most of the time nowadays they're on the pitch because they're shouting the players, but they're meant to be in the dugout, aren't they? Sometimes you see the ref come along, he's trying to shoot them back in the dugout, or get back in the dugout, you know? But some of us do get the opportunity, the chance, to oversee from the dugout, don't we? Some of us get given the responsibility of managing those on the pitch. And that's what Paul's talking about when he addresses the slave masters in verse 9. He says, uh, in verse 9, And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. So he's saying, look, God doesn't think you're any better because you, you own these slaves. There's no favouritism with God. Slavery is a product of like our fallen society. The fact that men want to domineer men. But with God, there's no favouritism. There's no favouritism. So some of us get the responsibility to manage those on the pitch, don't, don't, don't we? Some of us get the responsibility of managing. Now last night, Katie and I watched the new Lincoln film. You know about Abraham Lincoln, directed by Steven Spielberg? <coughs> and Lincoln, for me, is an amazing example of what it is to manage and direct things well from the dugout. Now we know about Lincoln that he, he, he made lots of moves towards ending slavery, didn't he? Um, he brought this thing into place called the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, where he was using the army to protect escaped slaves and encouraging um, border states 
to outlaw slavery. There were lots of states in the United States at that time where slavery was legal. And le the, Abraham Lincoln wanted the whole of the United States to abolish slavery because it had happened in England under Wilberforce a, a, few, a few years earlier. And um, he gets these people around him to help push through uh, Congress the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which is still in the Constitution today, where um, slavery was permanently outlawed. Yeah, what a guy! Yeah, what a guy! There's a there's a scene in that film. They're just about to vote on this uh, on this uh, ending of slavery, yeah, but to be put in law, and. Um, all, all the guys there in, in, in the White House are, are voting on this stuff. And um, even before the vote, it, this, this message comes in, someone gets a note, brings it to the, the speaker at the front. Oh, the, the, the other side, because obviously at the time, it was the Civil War, wasn't it? The, the other side, they, they want to come and they want to they wanna bring peace. They've got envoys that come in to tell us that they want to end the war, there's going to be peace. So, so, so they send this letter up to Lincoln, he's not even in, in, in the White House at the time, they send this, this note up to Lincoln saying, what are we going to do? Because there's these, these ambassadors coming in, these guys coming in, they're going to bring about an end to, to um, they're, they're, they're going to bring an end to the war. And, and, and Lincoln's in his study, he's there playing with his kid, yeah? They're, they're just having a bit of fun, he's reading his boy's story in, in this film. It's an amazing scene, and that these kind of big wigs come in and they're like, the, the vote can't go through, the vote can't go through because these envoys are coming and they, they want to they wanna end the war. And, and Lincoln just gets his note, no, 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 saying the vote goes ahead. This piece of paper is taken back to the White House and, and the vote goes ahead, yeah? And they, get, they need 19 votes to get this, this, uh, this amendment through. 19 votes, and, and the, uh, 20 votes rather, they get 19 votes, yeah? 19 votes, and then, and then the speaker at the end, that everyone's like, what are we gonna do? We've only got 19 votes, and the speaker at the end goes, excuse me, I wanna catch my vote. And they're like, well, the, the speaker can't vote. He said, on, 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 on issues like this, he can vote, actually. And they get the 20 votes, and of course, the amendment goes into place. I tell you, what a guy, what a guy. That's just incredible, isn't it? And, and what I want to say from that is that Lincoln, for me, was in the dugout. Yeah, he's not even in the he's not even in the White House at the time. He's in his house, which is at the side of the White House. He's in the dugout. Yeah. <coughs> Confederacy coming to him for peace. He writes his letter. Really chilled out about the situation. Really confident. Yeah. And what I love about this man is that he was able to value people and humbly lead men to get things done. He had authority, but wasn't forceful in him. And Jesus was the same. He carried divine authority, but was never cruel, was never self-serving, was never ma manipulative or physically forceful. And that's how we need to be if we've been given the responsibility to manage people. Yeah? We can't pick on people. We can't be overbearing and exploit people. We can't overlook people. We have to be patient. We have to see potential. We have to develop people. And if we want people to work hard for us, we must set an example by working hard ourselves. A boss sets the standard for his workforce. You ever seen a, a workforce in disarray? You work, 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 work in a company where things are in disarray. Look at the boss. Look at the boss. Boss sets the standard, and as Christians, we need to be people that are constantly developing in our work so that we're looking for the best jobs, the best opportunities, so we can make an a, a, a difference for Jesus Christ in this generation. And if we have an opportunity that comes our way to manage or uh, a, a, a finding a better job that's more challenging or being taken from a, a, a place where our job is unchallenging to a place where we've got more responsibility. We've got to step into that responsibility. God has called us to grow and develop ourselves, to be people who have influence. We need to push into these opportunities. We need to apply for um, promotions when they come our way. I want to encourage you to go, go for the best. 
to go for the best, sometimes by a little bit meek and mild, you know. I look at the, the, the rise of Islam in our nation, yeah? And, 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 and the amount of the amount of Islamic, I'm not, getting, I'm not against them anyway, I'm not saying anything kind of, uh, but what I'm saying is, is that they know that if they get in the media and they get into, um, if they get into, the gov into government and all these places, they've got influence. And of course, in generations gone by, the Christians were there. And this, the, the land, the landscape has changed in our generation and as Christians we've got to rise up to these challenges because of course, what, what we will see is a, 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 a diminishing of the Christian faith and an increase of other faiths who take the jobs and, and go into the spaces and go into the uh, gaps that we should be in. And I was just recently encouraged um, by Joel here at the front, who, who's just been given a promotion. I'm like, yes, got to give us one a promotion, that's fantastic. Job, Joel applied for a job recently, I hope you don't know him mentioning this job, applied for a job recently, and um, I was praying about that job for him, because I, I thought, yeah, great, if he gets a promotion, that's really good, isn't it? That's a really good thing for him, he's got more influence, uh, and of course, uh, Joel got that job, and that's just wonderful news, yeah? Wonderful news. We need to get off the pitch into the dugout sometimes, you know, God's calling us into the dugout where we become planners and visionaries and leaders of people like the football managers that we've seen in the Brazil World Cup this, this year. We need to be people who sometimes retrain. I've retrained. I retrain to be a pastor. We need to be people who study, like before we have a job interviews, and prepare ourselves. We need to show ourselves approved, <coughs> don't we? Show ourselves approved. And, you know, there's lots of resources out there for us as Christians. Lots of books we can read. There's lots of things we can get our hands on about being Christian in the workplace. You can go on Amazon. We we'll just put in Christian in the workplace or pop down to the Christian bookshop and bang and get some books and, and, uh, or, or speak to people who work and you've got, got, got things going in a good direction. You know, I'm constantly asking people for advice on all kinds of things and speaking to people. Because I know that I'm not a finished article. I need to learn from other people, and we all need to learn from each other. And what I wanted to say is that when Jesus had the opportunity to invade power structures, he always took them, whether it was with the Sanhedrin or in front of Pilate or down at the temple, he took those opportunities, and we need to do the same. So, in conclusion this morning, you know, whether you're on the pitch or in the dugout, let's work hard for Jesus. There's a carpenter making roof trusses and flooring beams and furniture, building new homes. Jesus knew that work was good. He also knew what it was to lead. And whether, our, whether your job uh, is on the pitch or in the dugout, we, we have to be people who, who are seeking to be a blessing to those around us and to be an influence for Jesus.